Okay, we are live. So, um, tonight's webinar is going to be a really, really cool one. We're going to go over firearms classification, specifically from the ATF side. Um, and let me just, uh, for those of you, I'm not, I, I never quite know where everybody's heard about this webinar from. I know that's improper grammar, but um, so I like to always kind of give you guys a, a little background on the school, um, just so that anybody who's new to SDI kind of understands what's going on here. So. We are a DEAC accredited online learning school um, specific to firearms technology and gunsmithing and we offer a couple different programs and courses. All of them are at home and online. Um, schedules are pretty flexible. Uh, we're, we really kind of exist for military guys, people who, um, guys and gals, people who uh, work full time and need to have some flexibility in their online studies, people who are passionate about firearms and want to kind of take that passion to the next level. Um, and we offer, we do offer a full associate degree. Um, it's a, an associate of science in firearms technology, 60 credit hour program there. There are some general education courses there and uh, if you've had previous college before and even in some cases military experience, we do look into potential transfer credits. So it'll be of course based on your transcripts and all that good stuff, but that is, um, for that program specifically, that is an option. The Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate uh, program is the 32 credit hour program. Both of those first two are approved for use of most TA and VA benefits uh, that are offered. So if you are eligible for um, some sort of benefit program like that, we can certainly help you look into that and, um, and help you start the process there. That Associate of Science in Firearms Technology degree program is also recently, within the last couple months here, um, approved for participation in federal student aid. And again, all of these things are of course based on eligibility, but we do have that option uh, available for the associate degree. We also do a ballistics and reloading certificate, which is really cool. Um, it includes a Hornady lock and load press uh, and a couple different options there. And then we have three advanced armor courses, Air 15, Air 10, 1911. They all have the same basic uh, set up, you know, you'll do history, you'll do ammo, you'll do mods, you'll do accessories, buy versus build, all that good stuff. Um, but there are individual armor courses that you can take, like I said, individually or as part of your Associate of Science in Firearms Technology degree program or the Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate. So if you, if you take one of those two, two programs, um, you can choose one of those courses as part of that program. So. If you have questions, sdi.edu is our website. Admissions at sdi.edu is the best email address. Um, or you can call that 844 number, 844 Anybody in the admissions team that you'll get is going to be awesome, um, and they'll help you with everything you need to know. So that's my spiel. Let's move forward. Um, and I'm trying to kind of breeze through some of this because I know, Dan, we've got a lot to cover. So. Dan O'Kelly, everybody. Um, Dan's kind of a big deal, as you'll see. <laughs> Dan, I'm going to let you kind of talk about your background a little bit. Um, this is Dan's first year as a member of the SDI Advisory Board, and we are super excited to have him. His credentials are just phenomenal. If you want to see a full write-up on them, we do have those on the Learn from the Best page on our website, or they're also, uh, you also have a bio on the gunlearn.com. Is that right, Dan? Yes, I do. Okay, cool. Yeah, why don't you take over for me then and tell us a little bit about where you come from, what you did, all that good stuff. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. No First problem. of all, it's a pleasure to be partnered up with SDI. Um, I, uh, I started out as a police officer uh, way back in the dark ages before most of our listeners were probably born, and uh, after 11 years as a cop, uh, don't shoot the messenger, but I became an ATF agent. Uh, <laughs> You know, the fact is I'm an NRA benefactor. I've been an NRA member longer than I worked for ATF, but uh, I was an ATF agent for 23 years. I was one of their firearm specialists, uh, which means I eat, breathe, and live guns. And uh, as much as most people might think, uh, there are not a lot of gun experts in ATF, so they welcomed me as a guy who knew something about guns. And uh, I wrote, co-wrote, to be fair, I co-wrote the lesson plans that ATF uses at their academy back in 1998. And uh, one sad but funny story is that prior to 1998, ATF only gave their own people one eight-hour day of firearm technology and markings training. And in 1998, when they had a big hiring binge, 
they told all of we subject matter experts that were on the staff there, hey, you guys go and rewrite your programs. You know, you do your arson stuff, you do your explosive stuff, et cetera. And uh, obviously, I was one of the guys that did guns. They said, we want you to write a program that is completely comprehensive. It's going to make all of our people competent when they go through this. You know, going forward, they're going to know everything they need to know about guns. Well, we did that. And it was a six-day course. I knew we couldn't get away with weeks and weeks. You know, how much can you teach in six days? But still, it at least takes that long. And they looked at it and balked and said, you're kidding. We're not giving you six days just for guns. And I said, well, that's what you said you wanted us to do. This is a comprehensive, <laughs> no-fluff course. So they proceeded to say, well, we'll give you three and a half days. And uh, here's the 40% of it that we want you to throw away. Uh, so they were way higher a pay grade than any of us were. And uh, so for the last 19 years, even ATF people only get 60% of what they need to be competent in the field, as far as my humble opinion goes. And that sort of explains some things. But to get to the point, when I left ATF, um, I said, you know what, this material needs to be put out there for the gun industry and for the rest of law enforcement. Uh, there's nothing classified or secret, but ATF's not in the business of teaching, so we will be. So uh, we formed the International Firearm Specialist Academy, or the, the easier way to say it is gunlearn.com. And we have a 14-module program uh, that's available in live seminars, seminars or online. And we've been doing that for the last five years, uh, trying to get this info out to all the pro-gun, pro-law enforcement folks and uh, clear up what ATF seems to leave a lot of gaps in. So. That pretty much sums up what we're doing. Awesome. And and what's interesting about tonight for you guys um, in attendance is that, you know, gunlearn.com has, like you said, all those different modules. Um, and we're going to actually see quite a bit of one of the modules tonight. Um, there are going to be time constraints, of course. But uh, you'll see Dan knows everything about everything when it comes to this type of thing. And we're going to go through quite a big chunk of one of these modules. So you guys are going to be in a little bit of a, of a unique, um, I guess you'll have a little bit of a unique experience in that way tonight. So Dan, why don't you go ahead and I am going to flip the screen over to you, if I can figure out how to do that one second. Um, Dan O'Kelly, yes, I'm sure. So Dan, whenever you get that little notification, um, go ahead and accept it, and I will make sure that everybody can, can see your screen here. By the way, I hate that buildup. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? That you know everything about everything? <laughs> yeah, that's just a like bit of a hard act to follow. That's not true. <laughs> that's um, far from true. Okay, so are you seeing then, let me get all the way out of here. Tell me what you're oh, there we go. Can everybody uh, go in the comment section let me know if you can see the firearm classification slide? Yes. Awesome. We're good to go. Okay, Dan. Um, it's all you, and I will keep, I'll keep looking at some of the questions here that are popping up for you. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do here is, um, you know, how does ATF classify firearms? It's sort of important. Um, well, we'll get into that in the next slide, but the reason... Uh, that being able to correctly classify firearms is very important is because so many people build their own firearms and or modify home-built and factory-made guns. Uh, doing so without understanding classification can lead to a person's arrest or loss of licensing, a lot of financial problems. In other words, you get a lot of problems, a lot of trouble. So we want to we want to avoid that. Uh, depending on where you work or live, the legal definitions of firearms can vary from state to state. Uh, but, of course, we're all part of the United States, so if we learn federal law, uh, please know that almost every state, when they write their own state's definition of a firearm or their state's definition of a, a rifle or a pistol or whatever, they're basically taking the federal law, and then they may modify it by a few words, but in essence, it's vastly, you know, the federal law. So if we learn what the federal definitions are, then no matter where you are, you look at your state's definition, you're, you're going to understand where it came from. I uh, want to point out, very important, even though it sounds boring as heck, if you learn the definitions concerning firearms, you're vastly on your way toward being a gun expert. So I think you'll see some of that as we go along. Uh, in the legalese, 
the, the, we're going to talk about number one, what is a firearm and what is not a firearm? There are things you can shoot somebody with and there are things that uh, you could never shoot somebody with that are not firearms. Some of the things you could shoot somebody with are not firearms. How does that make any sense? Uh, we'll clarify that. Uh, then once we determine what is a firearm, everybody thinks, for the most part, that all guns are either a pistol, revolver, rifle, or a shotgun. That's not true. There's one more category that's very unclear or very few people know about in some cases. And uh, the reason that's important is you can do a lot of things that you might think were illegal otherwise if, if you didn't know about that category. Um, then we're going to cover a few things such as can a handgun or other firearms be made into a long gun without ATF approval? Once you do so, can it be made back into its original classification without ATF approval? Um, we're going to cover on the fact that in many cases, once something becomes a long gun, in other words, a rifle or shotgun, that ATF considers it always a rifle or shotgun. We'll clarify that you can't make something necessarily into a rifle or shotgun from a bear receiver or a handgun and then go back to handgun without getting yourself in hot water. Um, we're going to cover on the topic of putting vertical foregrips on handguns. I'll uh, talk quickly about forearm braces, something that caused a lot of grief for a lot of people in the last few years. Um, and then when does a firearm stop being a firearm? And last, the definition of a receiver. We're going to shock everybody's gourd a little bit about something ATF is doing concerning the definition of a firearm um, receiver. You're, you're going to be surprised when you see this. So to move ahead, um, in plain English, the definition of a firearm is actually four definitions, as you see on the screen. First one is the one everybody knows. Any weapon which expels a projectile by means of an explosive, by the action of an explosive. You have three prongs there. If it's a weapon, expels a projectile, action of an explosive. B, the second definition of a firearm, any frame or receiver of any such firearm. So in other words, you take any firearm to completely apart, every last pin, screw, spring, take it all down to bare bones, uh, lay it all out on the table. One part is still a firearm. That's the frame or receiver. Everything else is a bale of hay. It's one way I like to put it. It's just of no concern under the law. Um, then the third one, any firearm muffler or silencer. Again, even though you can't shoot anybody with a silencer by itself, it's considered a firearm under federal law. And then any, any destructive device. Those are the big things. Everything over 50 caliber, the stuff that explodes, burns, contains poison gas, all that. Uh, those are the four definitions of a firearm under the Gun Control Act. Now, two of those, that being C and D, a silencer and a destructive device, those are also firearms under the NFA or National Firearms Act, the stuff that has to be registered with ATF, of course, uh, prior to making or possessing. And because of that, they each have their own module uh, otherwise in the course. So we're not going to be covering those tonight. They have their own topics, uh, their own modules. So we're only going to cover for tonight uh, A and B, any weapon which expels a projectile by the action of an explosive, and the frame or receiver of any such weapon. Hey, so, Dan, again, I, have two, I have two real quick sure. uh, follow-up questions here. Um, one of them was a little bit of confusion on the explosion part of it. Um, mm -hmm. He, oh, shoot, I just lost it. One second. Uh, from my memory, the GC of 1969 uh, was off because no firearm uses an explosion, to, an explosion to propel a bullet. Does this make any sense, or am I way off? James. Uh, I'm not sure where you're going with that. Let's let me clarify this if this helps. That um, the reason that the first definition of a firearm is any weapon which expels a project projectile by means of an explosive. In other words, a BB gun or a pellet gun is a weapon and it expels a projectile, but it doesn't use an explosive to do so. That's why, because it's missing that one prong of the definition, those are not firearms. Okay. Um, so only weapons which throw out some kind of a projectile and use an explosive to do it are considered firearms. Okay. Um, is that James, where we can go? Yeah, I think so. He was okay. just saying powder doesn't detonate. You know, it burns to slow. So he, there was some well, confusion there. So. Okay. Still considered Quickly on that though, note, all right. Yeah, it is a burning rate, but according to the explosive definitions, which we don't have time to get into, <laughs> um, you know, the difference between all powders and all ex 
flammable materials is the rate at which they burn. But when you get up in the 26,000 feet per second uh, area in, in that area, you're talking an explosive. Again, we could argue that on another webinar, but uh, sure, sure. It is no, what he it says is. understood. ATF no has problem. ruled all smokeless powder to be a high explosive, uh, okay. as well as okay. black powder is a low explosive. All right. Awesome. Um, so um, some items that I'm sorry. Hold was on. There another one, one? one more. Yep. One more, and then and this should be pretty quick. Um, is a silencer considered a firearm because it's regulated? Well, it's the other way around. A firearm is a silencer is regulated because it's considered a firearm. Okay. It's it's not a firearm because it's regulated. It's regulated because it's a firearm. Now, why politicians uh, decided to consider this inanimate object, which does not expel anything by itself, a <laughs> firearm, again, is another topic for another right. webinar. <laughs> hey yeah. guys, hey. I'm pro-gun as I can possibly be, and I guarantee you, if we ever have a beer with some of the guys out there, I'm easily as pro-gun or more pro-gun than any, any of our listeners. So let me clarify that. Um, <laughs> and gun laws, guys, do not make sense. I'm not going to try to tell anybody here at any point that gun laws make sense. They're made by people who don't know anything about guns, and then we have to live with them. So that's why I want to clear some of this up this <laughs> evening. Perfect. Um, okay, we're good. Go for it. <laughs> okay, so th those are what are what are firearms. Those four things. Uh, what are not firearms? Even though you can shoot somebody, well, that's a category that ATF calls antique firearms, and that's another stupid name because number one, they don't have to be old. So why did they use the word antique? They could be made today. Um, secondly, if it falls into this category, it's not a firearm, but yet they chose the name antique firearms for this category. So. That makes a lot of sense, right? <laughs> um, there are four things that, uh, and there's what I just said, sort of behind on this, this slide there. Um, the reason that these shootable items are not defined as firearms is because when the Gun Control Act was being written, pro-gun and anti-gun interests had to agree that certain categories of shootable items are more likely to be used as collectibles than as weapons. So, you know, you have this cat and mouse game when it comes to federal gun laws. And uh, so they got together and fought. And they agreed, okay, there are four categories of things which are not going to be considered or regulated as firearms, even though you can shoot somebody with them. The first of those four is anything that came out of the factory before January 1st of 1899. So it doesn't matter what caliber it's in, uh, anything else. If it came out of the factory January 1st of 1899 or later, it's a firearm. And if it came out of the factory prior to that date, it's not. So, you know, to illustrate that example, these two single-action Colts could be one day apart in manufacture, but merely because of that, one's not a gun and one is. Um, second category of things that are non-guns, any muzzleloader which does not incorporate the receiver of a firearm, uh, it has to be a muzzleloader. In other words, you have to pour the loose powder down the business end of the barrel and then the, the lead ball with a ramrod. Uh, and no part of that item can be anything that ATF considers to be the receiver of a firearm. So, you know, they added that to the definition so no one can go turn their AK-47 into a muzzleloader and say, hey, this is not a gun anymore because it still would incorporate that receiver of a firearm, which is a firearm by itself. Um, third one. Anything with an antique ignition system, again, no matter when it was made, it could have been made today because factories still do make these for reenactors, hunters, what have you. Uh, match locks, wheel locks, flint locks, uh, percussion locks, also known as cap and ball type firearms. So no matter when they were made, these things are not firearms under federal law because they possess an antique ignition system. And then the fourth one is any replica, meaning a copy, of a pre-1899 design, which is also chambered for cartridge that is not commercially available. Now that sounds like a mouthful, but in other words, if it's a copy, even though made today, of something that was designed prior to 1899, like a Winchester Model 1894, even though it's made today, it's a copy of a pre-1899 design that was invented in 1894. If it's in a caliber that's not commercially available, that is not available in commercial trade. That item is not a firearm. Why would anybody make something like that? It would normally it would be a commemorative. Uh, let's say somebody came out with a copy of the 1894 Winchester in 30 carbine because they wanted to commemorate 
Wells Fargo or somebody, you know, the old stagecoach company, whatever reason. Uh, it would be more intended as a wall hanger, and since the ammo is not commercially available, uh, even though the thing's a day old, it's not considered a firearm. So those are the four things that are not guns, even though they can be fired. Okay, now, quick, quick question. Sure. Um, what about inline muzzle loader that doesn't use loose powder? Okay. Uh, muzzle lo inline muzzle loaders, some of them are strictly muzzle loaders, and some of them have interchangeable barrels. Uh, this was also a court case. ATF originally tried to say that, you know, these things are guns if they use uh, 209 shotgun primers instead of just percussion caps. Uh, and then the court struck them down on that uh, and said, no, you know, if it's a muzzle loader only and it doesn't incorporate the receiver of a firearm, it is not a firearm. However, if it's one of these firearms that, you know, you can put one barrel on it that's a muzzle loader and another barrel that uses 30-30 cartridges or 22 long rifle, that one is a firearm. So it depends on what model you're talking about. Okay, cool. So before we move on, um, there are some things that are not guns, such as a cap and ball revolver, that can be turned into a firearm. And here's an example of how. Uh, let's say you have one of these cap and ball revolvers and you go buy one of these conversion cylinders that you see on the screen. The way this thing works, you take this plate off the front, put in cartridges, whether it's a 38 or a 44, because um, cap and ball revolvers come in both calibers, basically. Uh, 36, they call it, which is what 38 caliber actually is, 36 caliber. You put that plate back on each, you can see each chamber has its own firing pin and uh, put that cylinder into the gun, now it fires modern ammunition. It's no longer exempted from the definition of a firearm because it no longer has an antique ignition system. So because it's a weapon that expels a projectile by means of an explosive and it's not exempted as an antique, now it becomes a firearm. So there's one example of how an antique can become a firearm. Um, another example uh, there's a situation where a firearm can become an antique. Let's say you have a Winchester Model 94 at home in 3030 caliber. What happens the day that everybody quits making 3030 ammunition? Or pick any cartridge. It doesn't matter what the cartridge is. Once the ammunition for that gun is no longer commercially available, if that ever happens, then that gun would become an antique immediately because it fits that definition we covered. It's a replica of a pre-1899 design and all of a sudden it now has the other prong of the definition. It's chambered in a cartridge which is no longer commercially available. So here's an example of how something can go from non-gun to gun or gun to non-gun. Um, let's move ahead to, we covered that stuff already, an example of definition number two, the frame or receiver of any such firearm. So the frame of a firearm is a firearm. Here's an example of the AR type receiver. Um, again, we mentioned that other than the frame of any given gun, every other part is non regulated unless you're talking about import or export. There's no regulation on possession of gun parts other than the receiver or the sale of them. Okay, we've covered what is and what is not a gun, guys. Um, now that we know what is a firearm, let's divide them into their various categories. Again, most people believe that all guns are either a pistol, a revolver, a rifle, or a shotgun, and that's not true. Uh, if any of you out there have a dealer's license or you worked in a gun store, if you're familiar with ATF's Form 4473, if you've ever looked at Block 18, that's the first block that the dealer fills out after you fill out your part, sign it, and date it. Block 18 wants the dealer to mark down what kind of a gun are you buying. It has three little boxes in it. One is handgun, one is long gun, and one says other. Uh, some of you realize that other includes bare receivers. We're going to take it a little further. So all guns are either handguns, means something designed to be held and fired in one hand. That includes pistols and revolvers. Or, and here's the definition of a pistol. I'm sure everybody out here uh, is more than familiar with a pistol is something, you know, that has a chamber integral to the barrel, a grip at an angle to the barrel, and designed to be held in one hand. All right. Revolver, same thing. The plain English definition is 
a weapon of the pistol type having a revolving cylinder. Uh, long guns are rifles and shotguns. In other words, these are guns that are designed to be fired from the shoulder. And the only difference between them is not what kind of action they have, not what kind of caliber or ammunition they use, but simply whether or not they have a rifled barrel or a smooth bore. Um, there's the long definition. We'll get past these and save a minute. So just remember that long guns all have a shoulder stock. They are shoulder-fired weapons, and then they have either a rifle bore, which is a rifle, or a smooth bore, which is a shotgun. The important point to remember is, again, it has nothing to do with the ammunition. So as an example, there's such a thing as a 12-gauge rifle, and there's such a thing as a 9-millimeter shotgun. How can that be? Well, if you look at the definition, again, shoulder fired with a rifled barrel or shoulder fired with a smooth bore barrel. ATF has ruled uh, that if you change the barrel on your, say you have a Remington 870 shotgun with a smooth bore, you go buy a rifled slug barrel for that gun, which Remington sells, they make them. Once you switch that barrel, that firearm is no longer a shotgun. Now it's a rifle. Why does that matter? Because you could go the other way too. You could change from a rifled barrel to a smooth barrel for whatever reason you have. Once you do that, the minimum barrel length requirement changes. Uh, once you put that rifled barrel on your Remington 870, the barrel only has to be 16 inches long now. It doesn't have to be 18 inches anymore because the firearm is no longer a shotgun. It's a rifle. Um, and vice versa. If you were to, and somebody's going to laugh, but trust me, if you haven't seen it yet, you will. Somebody does everything humanly possible to a gun at some point, if for no other reason. They want to be the guy who did it, right? So let's say you made a smooth bore AR-15. You want to fire shot cartridges out of it. If you did that, you'd have to make sure that the barrel's 18 inches long, because otherwise you just made a short-barreled shotgun because a smooth bore AR-15 would be classified as a shotgun. Here's the, the example, and we'll get off of that. Uh, Savage makes these bolt action 12 and 20 gauges. They have rifled barrels, and they are classified as rifles. Uh, so many dealers and manufacturers even incorrectly list these as shotguns. That's not correct. They are rifles. So. Um, Here's the last picture we'll show. Uh, this, this thing you see here, this is a Remington 870, and uh, it does have a rifled barrel. So what are the minimum measurements? It has to have a 16-inch barrel, not an 18, and it only has to be a 26 overall length gun. There's nothing illegal about this firearm. So again, if you were going to do modifications, you need to know these things to stay out of trouble. All right, let's move on. We've covered long guns and handguns. What's this other category? Well, again, any bare receiver. It is a firearm. Hope everybody agrees with that by now. So again, we'll use our AR-15 receiver as an example. This thing is a firearm, but it's not a rifle. It's not a pistol, it's not a revolver, and it's not a shotgun. And a lot of people have argued, well, you know, it's going to be turned into either a rifle or a pistol. Well, not necessarily, guys. If you're a machinist and you have the machines and the know-how, you can turn it into anything. You can turn it into a shotgun. You could even turn it into a revolver. There has been an example of that made. It's just a firearm. It doesn't have the features necessary to satisfy the definition of any of those first four. So let's say I buy that, I take it home, and I do this to it. I uh, don't have a barrel yet, but I put on a shoulder stock on the buffer tube, put on a pistol grip, I put in the firing components. What is it classified as now? A lot of people would say, well, that's a rifle. It's designed to be fired from the shoulder. Well, that's not correct because, again, the definition of a rifle is a firearm that's designed to be fired from the shoulder and has a rifled bore. This gun has no bore, so it has not crossed into the definition of a rifle yet. It's still just an other. It's also not a pistol. It's not designed to be fired in one hand and having a grip at an angle to the bore because, again, it doesn't have a bore. So I change my mind about what I'm going to build this into. I take the shoulder stock off, and I want to get rid of it. I don't even want it in my possession because uh, if I still possess it, some cop or some ATF agent might make a case against me that I'm in possession of 
you know, constructive possession of a short-barreled rifle or shotgun. So we don't even own this short, this uh, shoulder stock anymore. We put simply the smooth buffer tube on the receiver, and uh, we go and we get our barrel, our barreled upper. We put it on there, and we can do it in a couple of configurations, as you see on the screen here. The one on the top is less than 26 inches. It's as a result, but according to ATS, that is a pistol. It's designed to be fired in one hand. It's not designed to be fired from the shoulder, and it's less than 26 inches overall. It's just a pistol. The one on the bottom, however, if I put it together with that length barrel and put a vertical foregrip on it, this is not a pistol. It's still just a firearm. It's an other. This is not a rifle or a shotgun because it's not designed to be fired from the shoulder, and it's not a handgun because it's not designed to be fired with one hand. It's also, according to ATF, not in any other weapon. That's what a lot of people confuse, get confused on when we talk about this concept of another. There's a difference between an other, guys, and an any other weapon. An other is just any GCA firearm, shootable or not, which is not a rifle, shotgun, pistol, or revolver. And any other weapon, on the other hand, is something that falls into the, one of the three definitions that you can read, you know, of and any other weapon. That's again a different category. We'll go into another time. Um, so again, this firearm on the bottom. This is an example of something that a company called Franklin Armory puts out. It's called their Model XO26. It's 26 inches overall length. So ATF says, okay, it's not designed to be concealed on the person. That's the measurement that ATF uses to make that cutoff. If it's 26 or more, it's not designed to be fired on the person, and as long as it's not shoulder intended to be shoulder fired and not intended to be fired with one hand, it's not a handgun or a long gun or an NFA firearm. It's just a firearm. It's called an other. Um, so as we look at these three Right here, these are just others. You have stripped frames, you have one that has parts on it, but they're not complete enough to be anything other than just a bare frame. Uh, these two, again, came straight from the factory like this, this Thompson Center Contender frame. It has parts, but it doesn't have enough parts to qualify as pistol, revolver, rifle, or shotgun. Same thing with this bull quartz and barreled receiver. Uh, can you fire it? Sure. It's not designed to be fired, though. It doesn't have enough features yet uh, to determine whether it's intended or designed to be held in one hand or shoulder fired. So it's still just an other. It doesn't fit pistol, revolver, rifle, or shotgun. So I hope that's becoming clear. Um, oh, I have one um, additional other question or sure. question about other. Can the other be longer than 26 inches overall? Sure. It has to be at least 26 inches. It can be as long as you want it, but it has to be at least 26. If it's under 26, ATF says that's concealable on the person, and anything that's concealable on the person is in any other weapon unless it falls into the definition of a conventional pistol or a conventional revolver. So that's that area that nobody's usually familiar with. Okay. Okay. 26 or more long and not designed to be fired from the shoulder or with one hand. Okay. I have so, a ton of questions here about receivers too. Do you want me to get into those? Sure. Let's and a, do that a lot of it we is leave about, anybody behind. Right. Um, and so we, we have a couple of them. I'm gonna try to condense a couple of them into one question. One of them is um, what ATF legal restrictions, if any, are associated with an eighty percent receiver build like the one you would do in an SDI program? What legal restrictions are on an 80% receiver? None is the short okay. answer because, okay. let me clarify that ATF has never acknowledged the percentage assigned to an incomplete receiver. Uh, I don't know who came up with the number 80, but keep this in mind. For any model of firearm receiver, whether you're talking an AR receiver, a 1911 receiver, a Glock receiver, there's a lot of machine operations, or maybe not so many, that have to be done. They're all different. 
And with any given receiver, let's say we're talking about an AR blower, uh, you know, the one I'm working on, I might have done A through N, and you might have done N through Z. So there's just so many different variations of completeness. ATF doesn't put a percentage on it. They go on a case-by-case -case basis. The decisions that they've ruled on concerning AR lowers is that you can do all of the machining, res uh, machining processes you want to an AR lower except you cannot do any machining or indexing, and we'll cover that in a second. Any machining or indexing to the fire control cavity or to the hammer pin, the trigger pin, or the selector hole. Um, again, indexing means marking. You can't even make marks or little dings, uh, inscribing, whatever. You can't make any indications on this unfinished receiver showing where uh, the fire control cavity is to be milled out, where the hammer or uh, trigger pin or the selector hole go. Um, they've been struck down in court on that in one uh, one criminal case um, concerning flats, for instance, AK-47 flats. They charged a guy once with uh, flats that were indexed for AKs and said, well, these are receivers. And the federal judge said, wait a minute, it's a flat piece of metal, and because it has lines drawn on it, you're calling it a firearm. ATF said yes. The judge said in that case, you know, that's akin to drawing lines on a sheet of paper and saying now it's a paper airplane. He said, that's not going to fly, no pun intended. He said, you would have to actually fold it up and do something to it before it's an airplane, so I'm throwing this case out of court. So ATF has been shot down on, on this uh, indexing issue before, but they still stick to it because that only applies in that one judicial district. Um, so okay. an 80% receiver, as long as it's not to the point where it's had those three holes or the fire control cavity worked on or indexed, it's a bale of hay. There is no ATF overview on it. Okay. Uh, um, I have a couple questions here that I think go along with this about serial numbers. Um, first, first of all, and this one gets a little bit specific, but Tom, let me know if, if I'm not getting this right. Um, when will ATF clarify ruling 2015-1 uh, to make clear that there is no reason to finish or complete an 80% receiver blank by a licensed manufacturer. I know this ruling was to end build parties, but anyone can finish a blank receiver without the assistance of a licensed manufacturer. That's question number one. When's ATF going to do something? That's a good question. When you find <laughs> out, let me know. You know I only I, wish I said you know everything. I didn't say you were clairvoyant, I, right? <laughs> I wish they kept me abreast of this stuff. I don't even think they know. Um, you know, the, the thing is, when it comes to finishing AR blanks, um, I'm sure, you know, all of the listeners have read the ATF ruling that says if you're paying somebody else to do it or if you're renting their machinery to do it, and now they're required to be a manufacturer, and, you know, there's all that, but mm -hmm. who knows? That I don't know. Um. This, there's a kind of a part two version of that question as well um, with regard to 27 CFR 478.92. This is totally out of my realm of knowledge here, Tom. So, um, In reference to whether the builder of an 80% receiver is required to mark the receiver with a serial number, as far as I know, it's only highly recommended that some form of marking be made to the receiver to track it in case of loss or theft. And that rolls into a couple, a couple other people were wondering, well, Specifically, FBI, we send out 80% lower receivers. They don't have serial numbers. How is that okay? That type of thing. Okay, again, if it's still to that point that it's not considered a firearm, which we all like to call 80%, even though they don't acknowledge that number, as long as it has not had the, the, the things done to it that they consider to make it a firearm, it's nothing. It's, uh, you know, it's an empty soda can. So legally, you can send that, sell it, kick it down the street, give it to a six-year-old, give it to a felon, you can do anything you want with it, and they don't care. There's no no restrictions whatsoever on an 80% lower. Um, once you complete it or once you do any of those four things that I listed, now it becomes a firearm. And the only person or entity required to mark a firearm is a licensed manufacturer. Uh, you don't have to be licensed as a manufacturer unless you are, quote, engaged in the business. In other words, 
and then then we have to define that engaged in the business means you're doing it for the likely principal livelihood and profit uh, you're doing it as your principal livelihood and profit that you know opens up another whole can of worms but unless you're a licensed manufacturer you do not have to mark a firearm anyone can make their own firearm and uh, as long as you are not a prohibited person as long as you're not prohibited from buying a gun you're not prohibited from making a gun or possessing a gun and once you make it as long as it's a gun control act firearm namely not an NFA firearm you don't have to put any markings on it whatsoever the only time you do uh, the only time that changes is if you then sell it or take it across a state line uh, selling it you could be construed possibly as a dealer without a license uh, which requires you to have it marked before you sell it so that's the care you want to take there if you're going to sell it and taking it across state lines means you're now affecting interstate commerce which gets into another whole can of worms so as long as you don't sell it take it across the state line you don't have to mark it just make sure you're not a prohibited person and that it's not a contraband gun like anything under the NFA Okay, I think that's good for now. Okay. You keep um, going and I'll jump in more later. All right. <laughs> Let's look at this uh, three examples on the screen of a fireable other. These, now what we want to clarify is an other has to be built from a virgin receiver. You cannot take something that used to be, even for a split second, a shotgun or a rifle and build it into an other or a handgun. You can only build what we're talking about here from a virgin receiver. Uh, so Mossberg puts out this Model 500 just in case. Everybody calls these shotguns. So many dealerships put them down as shotguns in their book work. They're 4473s. These are not shotguns. The definition of a shotgun is a firearm designed to be fired from the shoulder and has a smooth barrel. Does this have a smooth barrel? Sure it does but it's never been designed to be fired from the shoulder so it is not a shotgun that may sound like hair splitting but hair splitting is what keeps you out of jail uh, this is not a shotgun it is a firearm that does not fall into any of the four cat you know the four definitions we keep listing um, look at the one under it the Franklin Armory XO26 we saw it a minute ago again built on a virgin receiver it's the, it, just like the Mossberg 26 inches long not designed to be fired in one hand and not designed to be fired from the shoulder. So they are not long guns, they are not handguns, and they are not NFA. The Auto Ordnance Model 27A5, now Auto Ordnance quit making this 27A5 several years ago, but you still see them for sale out there. Um, they still make a pistol version of the Tommy gun, uh, but it's not 26 inches long, and as a result it does not have this vertical foregrip. But the one that they used to make that is just an other, just a, uh, a fireable other, uh, has the vertical foregrip. It has a 13 and a half inch barrel that makes it 26 or more inches overall length. And because, again, it's not designed to be fired with one hand, it's not a handgun. Because it's never been designed to be fired from the shoulder, it's not a rifle or a shotgun. And at the risk of beating this horse to death because it's 26 inches long it's not concealable on the person so it's not an NFA any other weapon these are just GCA firearms you can build them yourself or possess them now once you possess them what else can you do with them we'll talk about that in just a second here's the last example I wanted to show you uh, the teaser that we gave out sort of to uh, you know generate interest in this webinar was saying that you can affect build your own short barrel rifle or short barrel shotgun without ATF approval here's the shotgun we're talking about and I use that word in quotations air quotes <laughs> because it's not a shotgun right um, this company out of Florida Black Aces Tactical I was just talking to the owner at the NRA convention last week his name is Eric Lemoyne um, he takes this these bare receivers he has them made it's a variation on the Mossberg 500 receiver uh, the variation is that it'll take a uh, 10 round Sega magazine so you have a 10 a 10 shot 12 gauge pump firearm uh, with a 9 inch barrel and I have to say it's pretty badass uh, he uses the buffer tube type you know extension on the rear 
and uh, that's how you get your 26 inches overall length. It does have the forearm brace on it. It doesn't have to, but it does have to have the, uh, the tube in order to get your 26 inches. So what are we looking at here? This is a purpose-built gun from a virgin receiver. It's 26 inches overall length, so it is not an NFA, you know, concealable on the person, any other weapon. It's not designed to be fired in one hand because you see the vertical, or even though it's angled, it's still considered vertical foregrip. And it's not designed to be fired from the shoulder because that's a fore, uh, forearm brace, not a shoulder stock. So this is not a shotgun or a rifle. So it is just a fireable other, um, you know, if you were to cheek weld, uh, put your cheek against that forearm brace, you would want to make sure that you keep that forearm brace a magical sixteenth of an inch or more off your shoulder because to put it against your shoulder you'd be violating the NFA. You would be repurposing that shoulder brace, uh, I'm sorry, that forearm brace, sorry about the slip there. You would be repurposing that forearm brace as a shoulder stock by putting it against your shoulder and you could be subject to prosecution. So you would never shoulder that. You would only put your cheek up to it, you know, to do a cheek weld for sighting purposes. And I hope that's clear to everybody. Yeah, I think so. Um, right. Are there any additional hoops or paperwork that need uh, jump through to purchase an other firearm? No, you have to be 21 years old. Um, federal law says you only need to be 18 to buy a rifle or a shotgun. Uh, but you have to be 21 to buy any firearm other than a rifle or a shotgun, such as a handgun and an other, because an other is not a rifle or a shotgun. So uh, okay. that's it. And the, so the action of shoulder firing and other alters its designation, is that right? Or its classification? Yes, if you were to put it either a bare buffer tube up against your shoulder or to put uh, the forearm brace up against your shoulder, ATF's ruling as of uh, December 2014, we'll see that letter in just a second, says that you would be repurposing or redesigning that shoulder, uh, that, that forearm brace or that buffer tube as a shoulder stock and that would make the firearm a rifle or a shotgun. Okay, and, and one more, so you can legally have an SBR or an SBS as long as it fits into the category of other. No, you would never call it an SBR or an SBS. <laughs> right. Short-barreled rifle or short-barreled <laughs> shotgun. What you would have is a 26-inch long 12-gauge 10-shot pump that you would never put against your shoulder or you would have a 26 inch long AR-15 type firearm that is neither designed to be shoulder fired or designed to be held and fired in one hand. Okay? okay. So I would stay away from the use of the word rifle or shotgun because okay. I hope that that's clear to everybody. Yeah, that's it still does the same thing but the way you hold it seems to make all the difference in the world to ATF. Right. So you would never want to hold it that way. Okay, cool. Um, all right, let's uh, jump ahead real quick. So we're talking about handguns, in other words, pistols or revolvers, and these pistol grip firearms, in other words, these shootable others. Can you make one of these into a long gun, that being a rifle or a shotgun? Sure, you can always make your firearms barrel or overall length longer. Um, you can legally make in any of these into a rifle or a shotgun without ATF approval by adding a 16 or 18 inch barrel uh, and a shoulder stock at the same time. There are kits on the market that allow you to do that. For instance, this Mechtech system, they call it the model CCU, I believe. It's a 16 inch barrel with a shoulder stock. You replace the slide in your pistol uh, and they make these for the Glock, for the 1911, for the Springfield XD. Take off your slide, put this on, and now you have a legal barrel length and overall length your firearm is now a rifle. Now that begs the question, once you do that, because ATF says once a long gun, always a long gun, once you do that, can you take that back off and put your slide back on and turn your gun back into a pistol, something designed to be fired in one hand? What if it was originally a firearm that was just an other and you do this? Can you go back to other configuration from, from what is now a long gun? Well, in some cases you can and some you cannot legally. Let's explain which is which. Um, in 1985, ATF advised Thompson Center Arms that when their carbine conversion kit was possessed or distributed together with their contender pistol, 
The unit consisted of a short barrel rifle subject to the NFA. The claims court agreed, saying that the contender pistol with its conversion kit is a short barrel rifle within the meanings of the NFA. Well, in 1991, because uh, Thompson Center kept fighting this, 1991, the Federal Court of Appeals reversed this, saying that a short barrel rifle actually must be assembled in order to be made within the meaning of the NFA. And uh, ATF then kept fighting it. And in 1992, it had gone all the way to the point of the U.S. Supreme Court, where they concluded that the contender pistol and carbine kit, when packaged together by Thompson Center, have not been made into a short barreled rifle for purposes of the NFA. Uh, after that, ATF came out with this four-page letter that you see on the screen, although you, uh, you can get this on the Internet. Just put in ATF ruling 2011-4. And this four-page letter explains all the ways in which you can go from pistol or other firearm to a long gun and back again legally. It also explains the types of conversions that would be illegal. Uh, so rather than spend 15 minutes on this alone, uh, if you're interested in this, download it, you know, print it out, read it, make sure you're clear on it. Uh, the bottom line is, folks, you can do it as long as you put a 16 or 18 inch barrel on your firearm before you put the shoulder stock on and then take the shoulder stock back off before you take the uh, put the short barrel back on. If you try to get away with something, you're going to get nailed. Um, so the bottom line is it can be legally done, but read that letter and be clear on what it says. Um, so back to where we were, let's, let's move ahead. Wait. I have a wait a minute question. Okay. <laughs> wait a minute. Not Just because the rifle isn't assembled, it was legal? Is that what's going on? What's that? Just because the rifle isn't assembled, it was legal. Is that is that right? Well, if it's, I'm not sure what you mean by not assembled. If the firearm's never been put together yet, then it's never um, actually been a rifle. From the ruling. Yeah, Ashley, chime in here and, and rephrase that question for me. I'll have Dan do it again isn't assembled. Yeah, maybe because it's not been built yet. I'm not I'm not getting a follow-up question from Oh, there okay. we go. Well, yeah. Okay, so that's what he's talking about. Yes, because it hasn't hadn't been assembled yet. Okay, let's say I go to the store and I buy a bear receiver. I buy a uh, a rifled barrel, I buy a shoulder stock, all the internal guts, pistol grip, and I just have not completed it yet. Well, until I complete it, that could be construed as constructive possession of a rifle because you have all the parts there necessary to make a rifle under the control of one person. However, as long as the barrel is 16 inches and put together, the whole thing would be 26, there's no violation of law. On the other hand, if the barrel is only 13 inches long, then yeah, that would be constructive possession of a short barreled rifle. Okay. So, uh, I mean, what else could it be built into? The fact that you have a shoulder <laughs> stock means that you know, there, there would be obvious intent there. So, yeah, that would be I, probably a hot water. <laughs> Ashley says, that's so much gray area. <laughs> oh, no, that's not gray. Constru trust me. Um, <laughs> constructive possession is, is a legal concept that's been fought in the courts for years. And uh, just because you take have something taken apart, I mean, if we were talking about destructive devices here, trust me, if you have, uh, if you go to the uh, military surplus store and you get one of these dummy hollow grenade bodies with the spoon assembly, and uh, also under your control, you have some safety fuse, a can of black powder, uh, some shotgun primers, uh, you know what I mean? All you have to do is right. finish putting everything together. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a tough way to go trying to explain <laughs> right. all that. You know, <laughs> Some other purpose in mind, trust me, it was totally right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So okay, good. Um, let's uh I know we're running short on time here, but if it's okay with everybody, we'll go just a couple minutes over because there have been a couple questions, Dan, on conversions. You know what I mean? Taking it from one to the other, and I know you you have that in these slides. So keep yeah, on let's keeping back on. Two here. Um, important notes on fireable others, in other words, uh, you know, these pistol grip firearms. Uh, they may be built, again, into a rifle or a shotgun without ATF approval. In other words, how would you do that? You put a shoulder stock on it. Once you put a shoulder stock on a smoothbore firearm, it is now a shotgun. 
once you put a shoulder stock onto a rifle barreled firearm, it is now a rifle. And as soon as that stock goes on, by the same token, you're required to have 16 or 18 inches of barrel and 26 inches overall length. If you're short on either measurement, you're in the NFA. It's not a GCA shotgun or rifle, it's an NFA shotgun or rifle. But as long as you have your two measurements, you're good. Uh, once that's done, it may not be changed into any configuration which does not maintain those two minimum lengths uh, without prior ATF approval. So let's say you have an AR pistol at home or an AR other and you go stick a shoulder stock on it. If you don't have 16 and 26, um, you're in the NFA. Um, even if you do have 16 and 26, if you then take the stock off or do something else to it, modify it so that you're no longer 16 and 26, you're in the NFA. So once a long gun, always a long gun, unless you are doing something that is covered by ATF ruling 2011-4, 2011-4 that we covered a couple of minutes ago. Uh, again, these aren't my rules, folks. I'm just telling you what ATF says, so don't kill the messenger. But I don't want to see anybody get in trouble. I'm just telling you how to slice this up. Um, putting a pistol grip, a vertical foregrip on a handgun, uh, it no longer is designed to be held and fired in one hand. So it no longer qualifies for the definition of a GCA pistol. It's no longer designed to be held and fired in one hand. Since it's also under 26 inches, it is conceivable on the person. Uh, the fact that it doesn't have a shoulder stock, it's not a rifle or a shotgun, the only category that it can fall into now is the first of the three definitions under any other weapon. So that's why putting a vertical foregrip on a handgun makes it an NFA violation. Uh, these two guns are, are just uh, GCA pistols. They were made this way by the factory. And the reason that they're GCA pistols is they fit the three prongs of the pistol definition. Chamber is integral to the barrel. They're designed to be fired with one hand, according to ATF, and they have a grip at an angle to the bore. So, although it may be arguable, that was ATF's ruling on these. And uh, forearm braces, again, when they were to, they were invented, the owner said, "Look, the purpose of this is for people with limited mobility. You know, maybe they only have one hand, one arm, or they don't have the physical strength to hold this heavy pistol up." ATF said, "Yeah, okay, it was sort of like a." a wink wink thing. Make sure you don't shoulder it because if you really intend to make it a uh, disguised shoulder stock, we're not going to have that. Um, a lot of people have been doing that and we, we talked about that. Uh, this is the letter where they said no, putting it on the gun does not make it NFA. Uh, then in 2014 they said even shoulder firing it, at least uh, a man by then, uh, I forget his name all of a sudden, um, at any rate, the man wrote the letter in March of 2014 saying shouldering it and firing it is not a problem. And then in December of 2014, he wasn't the head of FTB anymore. <laughs> uh, they had a new boss at that point, and he said, <laughs> no, that was a mistake. If you shoulder it, it's now a shoulder stock and the two lengths better be there, or it's NFA rather than GCA. Uh, those are the copies of the letters. They're on the web. You know, I don't know what's with the cocktail napkin, but the guy didn't want his name and address visible. Um, Mr. Lemoyne of Black Aces Tactical is sending me a new uh, copy. Uh, once I get it, I'll be updating this PowerPoint, uh, and it won't have a cocktail napkin on it anymore, but <laughs> that's what you're going to find on the Internet. Right. <laughs> um, and lastly, guys, I think this is about the last part, uh, a firearm You'll see firearms at times that have been, you know, dewatted, decommissioned, unserviceable, rendered inoperable, whatever. Uh, you'll see things such as cutting off the bolt face, filling the barrel with lead, welding the action shut, whatever. Uh, you'll even see these up on the stores in some of these big box sporting goods stores. And they'll say, oh, well, that, that one doesn't count anymore. It's been welded shut or whatever. ATF considers that a screwed up firearm, but it's still a firearm. Uh, ATF says a firearm is a firearm until it's been destroyed, and the only ways that a firearm is destroyed, according to them, is either A, it's been melted, number two, it's been crushed flat, which means it can't be put in, you know, can't be fixed, 
Uh, and number three, it has to be cut through the receiver three places and that each cut has to be diagonal and it has to use a torch which melts away a quarter of an inch of metal so it can't be pieced back together. Any other method, it's just a screwed up gun, but it's still a gun. Uh, machine gun, GCA, whatever, don't make that mistake. If you need a tutorial, ATF has it on this link at their website. Um, and uh, here's the last thing. This is the part I promised you that would shock some of you. Oh, yeah. uh, ATF wrote the definition of a receiver because any term they use, they have to write a definition of it. Well, what is a firearm frame or receiver? If you look at 27 CFR 478.11, it says that part of a firearm which provides housing for the hammer, bolt, or breech block and firing mechanism, and which is usually threaded at its forward portion to receive the barrel. Now that last phrase, and which is usually threaded, well that's not an all the time thing, so let's even cross that off. But prior to that, it says which provides housing for the hammer, comma, the bolt or breech block, comma, and firing mechanism, it means it has to have all three of those first three features. Well if we put that in plain English, here's what they are. It has to have these first three, and then there's a sometimes four, which again, let's ignore that one. Now let's apply this to some guns. We all know that the lower receiver of an AR is what ATF has been considering for 50-some years to be a firearm. Mm -hmm. Does it house the hammer? Sure. Does it house the bolt or breech block? No, it doesn't. Those are in the upper. Uh, the bolt, that is. It doesn't have a breech block. And number three, it houses the firing mechanism but it's not threaded at its forward portion to receive the barrel. That, again, is a feature of the upper. So even if we're not going to count number four, we're still missing one out of the three prongs that this definition requires for something to be a firearm. So how does ATF get away with calling that a firearm? Uh, if any of our listeners are familiar with Ares Defense, um, I'm sorry, Ares Armor, my mistake, there's a different company named Ares Defense, Ares Armor, uh, Dimitri Karras out of uh, San Diego, former combat marine. Uh, the gentleman was notified by ATF a few years ago because he was selling 80% uh, AR lowers, polymer lowers, uh, that he needed to become a licensed dealer. He refused and told them, no, I don't want to be a dealer. I'm not selling firearms. Get out of my store. ATF came back with a uh, search warrant and took 6,000 of these 80% polymer lowers away from him. And uh, then his attorney got a hold of us, said, can you make a determination on this as to where does it, this, this qualifies as a firearm or not under federal law? I said, certainly. I said, not only are these not receivers, but even if they were complete like the ones you're looking at in the picture, a complete AR lower does not match ATF's own definition of a firearm receiver. So I filed the 27-page uh, declaration with the court, and 30 days later, ATF's truck showed up in front of Mr. Karras's store and gave him back his 6,000 uh, polymer 80% lowers and uh, didn't charge anybody, didn't arrest anybody. Uh, 23 years as an ATF agent, I never saw ATF give back evidence in a case. <laughs> that a search warrant. So... Uh, Let's take this one last step. What is this next thing? This is the receiver of a Glock. We've all seen this. Does it house the hammer? No. The hammer actually is the striker in a Glock, and it's up in the slide. How about the bolt or breech block? Well, a Glock uses a breech block, and that's also up in the slide, although it does house the firing pin, I'm sorry, the firing mechanism. So we're at one out of three. The receiver, as ATF calls it, of a Glock only houses one, uh, I'm sorry, it only, it only has one of the three features that the definition requires. So how does this qualify as a firearm frame? Um, to take this a little further, you know, I, I don't know how ATF gets away with that. Either they don't know how the meaning of, in the use of commas it has used <laughs> with a definition. Um, maybe that no one else has paid enough attention to realize what they're getting away with here or because uh, their administrative authority allows them to make rulings unchecked by an outside authority. The only outfit that is out there that's bigger or above ATF is the federal government, and they're part of it. So the federal government is not correcting the federal government here. Um, if you guys want to think about this a little bit more, look at this list. 
the part of the Thompson 1921 and 28 uh, rifles and submachine guns and the M1, M1A1 uh, type firearms does not match ATF's own definition of a receiver. Neither do any of the Uzi type firearms. The Ruger 22 semi-automatic pistol that has been made by the, I don't know how many, since 1949. Uh, the HK MP5 and HK91 type firearms, the FAL, uh, nearly all semi automatic pistols, your Glock, SIGs, Smiths, Berettas, none of those receivers match ATF's definition, uh, nor do any of the Grand type rifle receivers. So uh, I hope that comes as a shock to some people, and uh, <laughs> I hope, you know, there's an answer to it somewhere down the road. Right. But anyway, Jeff, Jennifer, that is. Uh, I hope I haven't bored anyone to tears with that. I hope that's no, been some helpful information. Yeah, guys, am I right? You guys have really liked this one. We've had a super active comment section tonight. That's always a pretty good indicator good. that people are paying attention. <laughs> um, and in fact, we're gonna. I'm not going to be able to get to all of these questions. So what I'll do, Dan, is um, compile all of the questions that we didn't get to tonight, and I may touch base with you then off, you know, offline, and see if we can get some of these either, even just jotted down or something like that, and, sure, and sure. I can get back to you. On an email, um, you can send that out. Sure. I would like everybody to know that we have a full 14 module course online at gunlearn.com. Yep. If anyone wants to get certified as a firearm specialist and learn the rest of this, uh, that's where to find it, guys. A couple people asked um, the price range for those modules. The modules, if you buy all 14, the entire course, the retail price is 638. We are discounting it for SDI people. If you if you email me info at gunlearn.com mention SDI we're deeply discounting that to 499 folks awesome 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 okay cool so if you guys have any questions gunlearn.com or um, shoot me an email Jennifer at SDI.edu J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R at SDI.edu um, and I can kind of play middleman as well in case you guys need anything so okay I think that's it Dan thank you so much uh, this a pleasure. Was a fun thank one. You. yeah this has been awesome so um, everybody listening, thank you so much for attending. We still have almost everybody who started with us is still here. So thanks for, for hanging out with us a couple minutes late and everything. Um, and I will have this uh, recording posted by the end of the week. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody have a good night. All right. Thanks, Dan. Jennifer, are you... Uh...